Uh, Lee Alexander is a writer and narrative designer focused on generative story systems, digital society, and the future. She won the 2019 award for best writing in a video game from the Writers Guild of Great Britain for Reigns, Her Majesty, and her speculative fiction has been published in Slate and The Verge. She's currently designing games about intimacy and relationships and consults with teams of all sizes on narrative design. Her work often draws her 10 years as a journalist and critic on games and virtual worlds, and she frequently speaks about storytelling and design, online culture, and arts and technology. Most of her projects are at uh, leealexander.net. It's also Lee's birthday, but very sadly, Lee has come down with a flu and is not feeling well, so we are going to play a recording for Lee so that she can rest her voice, and then we will do some text Q&A at the end. So let's bring up Lee's talk. Hi, um, this is a recording of a talk for Roguelike Celebration 2023. Um, it's called McMansions of Hell. It's about a hobby project that I've made with my colleague, Brian Bucklew. Um, yeah, my name is Lee Alexander. I'm a narrative designer. I've been a game developer since about 2016, but um, I've been in the industry for a lot longer than that. First, I worked as a games journalist. Um, hopefully none of you remember my lost years. Um, it's a huge honor to be here. I've been interested in roguelikes and generative technology pretty much all my life. Um, I think my favorite growing up was this one, um, The Scarab of Raw on the Macintosh. And um, I work on all kinds of things these days, big things, indie things, um, PC, console, mobile, but um, probably the most, I guess, awarded project I've worked on during my career was Reigns Her Majesty um, with Niriel. Um, this is out on mobile, PC, and Switch. And in this game, we used a procedural system to tell um, choice-driven card-based stories about the life of a queen. And she's balancing her statistical power uh, in an environment where she has to be pleasing to everyone. And this um, is really kind of where I got the spreadsheet bug super bad. Um, so I'm here today to share um, currently an experimental project um, with my colleague Brian Buckley. Uh, many of you will know Brian um, from Caves of Quid as well as for, you know, generally his, you know, ongoing support for this community, his humane attitude to technology, um, and I, I think probably a lot of people in attendance have a lot to thank him for. Um, yeah, so the working title of our project is Mac Mansion, um, although we have also at times called it Adjective of Love or Apocalypse of Love. Um, so McMansion is a generative celebrity murder game uh, inspired by reality shows of the Y2Ks where um, eccentric celebrities and often aspiring celebrities would be confined to a garish, identikit California McMansion, um, usually on channels like VH1 and MTV, um, and their unexpected emotions and the conflicts and drama that would emerge um, would, would usually give us, I think, a, an interesting and humane look into unexpected and bizarre aspects of fame. Um, so McMansion um, plays tribute, uh, pays tribute to this heyday of reality TV. Um, you know, shows like Flavor of Love, Rock of Love, Tool Academy, um, Beauty and the Geek, Charm School, those were just a few I liked in the terrible 2Ks. Um, the characters are always confined to a mansion or similar space, and they have objectives to pursue, like you know, winning the heart of Brett Michaels, or you know, being chosen to be in a band, or reforming themselves in some way and proving that they've changed. Um, but all, all, all the while that they're pursuing these objectives, they are sort of conscientiously displaying the kinds of extreme behaviors that, that might lead to fame. Um, and to me, you know, these McMansion hells are the perfect um, roguelike dungeon setting. Uh, you may also notice we are working with the aesthetics of um, late 90s Macintosh shareware adventure games, um, partially because Scarab of Raw kind of made a permanent dent in my brain. Um, but I grew up with CDs full of literally hundreds of indie games made in a tool called World Builder um, to varying degrees of competency. Um, so uh, yeah, that made me feel, I, that's how I kind of first got the sensation of kind of being lost in a system where success was kind of random and I kind of got hooked on this little dopamine hit early on. Um, mostly we chose this aesthetic just because I really like it and um, to do something in this milieu has been a long time dream of mine, but I guess if I 
stretch myself a little bit, um, I can say something like, you know, well, these kinds of Macintosh adventures were, you know, incredibly spatial. They were constructed realities with these impeccably clear window displays um, and legible menus. Um, so that basically the UI and the game design were, were part of the same experience. Um, and to me, that's a, that's a good metaphor for vintage reality show games uh, too. <laughs> Did that work? Uh, so with McMansion, uh, Brian and I wanted to work with how celebrity culture within constructed reality um, can create these funny and kind of alien juxtapositions uh, and emergent behavior, most notably for our purposes today. Um, it's a super interesting time um, in culture and in technology to be thinking about the individual as a character. Um, these days, we all have the chance to suddenly become a main character, whether we consent or not. Um, we're all creating second versions of ourselves online and performing together in the constructed reality of social media, you know, which causes weird norms to emerge, um, specifically around the assignation of blame. Um, so we decided to kind of start tinkering with this idea, what if one of these vin vintage McMansion reality shows was some kind of generative murder experience? Um, yeah, we went pretty much straight to murder um, because as soon as we started simulating, you know, celebrity behavior in a constructed reality, it became clear to us that what we think of as celebrity behavior um, is our inherently like so unhinged that it, it's not a stretch. Um, you know, granted, right now we're in a place with the project where we started out tinkering around with the idea that the player is solving the murder and trying to figure out who did it. Um, and we've increasingly kind of started shifting Hitman style toward the realization that the player is doing the murders. Um, but what you'll see today is, is loosely about crime solving for now. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to take a minute to to show you the project first and then we'll we'll look under the hood. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So uh, I'm really just kind of going to wing it with with this baby here today. Uh, bear with me a little. As you know, like anything generative, sometimes it's you know going to produce tremendous serendipity right away, and sometimes it won't. Um, and also, depending on where in the world you're from and how old you are, you might not even actually know a lot of these celebrities. Um, I deliberately, at least for now, chose ones that were part of this boom in self-exposure mansion shows in the Y2Ks because I think that's when um, we started forging this vocabulary for celebrities who you know, were on TV uh, playing larger than life versions of their real selves, um, which is what all of us do now online from day to day. Um, and some of these characters kind of um, create created the mold, you know, for, for what it is to be a reality star. So I'm kind of paying tribute to them there. Um, this is my fault. Let's reload. Um, so let's see. I thought I disabled my blockers and stuff, but sometimes things are just a little. All right. So here we are outside the McMansion. And um, you can see we have some bars up here. These currently don't do anything. Um, again, Reigns is another project that dented my brain. And I like the idea of balancing statistics towards outcomes, but we'll, we'll kind of be taking these out. So um, the map of the mansion is, is the same every time we generate it. Um, and, but the images will be somewhat randomly generated, and uh, the, celeb the set of celebrities that appears in the house will be different each time. Um, and I will, after we do a demo, um, explain how that works. So we got Will Smith here. Just wait, see what Will does. Oh, MC Hammer arrives from the living room, and Will climbs into his lap. Okay. Um, and Liza Minnelli uh, arrives from the kitchen, and Liza and Will fall oddly silent. Um, maybe we should leave them alone, do you think? Let's see what else we got here. Uh, here's a living room with a glass table. Uh, we have an item system in here that Brian's currently working on developing further. Oh, wow. So no sooner have we encountered Tiffany Pollard, the famous New York, and uh, Jessica Simpson at the swimming pool, but we heard the sound of broken glass coming from the bedroom. So um, let's go and see. Uh, Will, Will's giving me a creepy feeling. Um, I happen to know where the bathroom is. Currently, the, the map is generated the same way each time, but it could be cool you know, to have increasingly generative and bizarre McMansions with you know, increasingly improbable architectures. Here we have Steve Harvey, who wants to know if we are familiar with accountability process. Um, Steve is a little concerned about Axl Rose, but let's go see what's going on 
in, in the bathroom at the minute. Oh my God, it's the blood spattered corpse of Sherlock Holmes. Um, so what will happen in this, oh, an ominous thud in the bedroom. So what happens uh, with this game is that one of the celebrities is assigned to be the murderer every turn and they will kill another celebrity as long as we leave them alone together. So let's go see who's dead in the bedroom. Oh, Steve, no. Wow, do you think Axl Rose did it? Um, yeah, Steve Steve was wanting to talk about accountability with Axel, Axel just a minute ago, so it's Axel. What's he doing? Is he gonna kill me too? No, he's attempting to flirt with me. Let's get out of here. Um, Axel's showing his appreciation for Liza Minnelli. He also seems to be following me. Um, <laughs> in the kitchen, we see Ellen DeGeneres trying to do product demonstrations, apparently with a cocaine jar, knife, and cutting board. So all of these things are murder weapons or evidentiary items. Um, that that eventually will be associated with, um, you know, the the method of the murder because not only you know figuring out who had opportunity, and motive is important, but um, also who had a murder weapon. So, uh, so Axel is following Ellen and Liza around. It sounds like uh, Axel says wants to play a game. I'm suspecting Axel of being the murderer because he was the only one alone with Steve. Um, I think I saw Travis Barker roaming around in this place too. Uh, Michael Phelps, MC Hammer, and Liza. Michael Phelps reports to me that uh, Hammer and Liza were making out. That's probably why Jessica Simpson has gone toward the foyer. Um, so MC Hammer's arrived from the bedroom. Hammer keeps talking over Ellen and Jessica. Uh, Jessica doesn't want to be left out. So basically you see that they have Axel standing way too close to, you know what, let's, let's get this over with Axel. So you can accuse someone of murder, which uh, we're going to do. And um, we were right. Yeah, at this point, in, in this particular instance, it was easy to tell who the murderer was because no one else was alone with poor Steve. Um, but let's run another instance and let's see what they do because... Um, the more you pay attention to their little behaviors, there's al already this kind of organic harmony in, in their extreme behaviors and, and the way that they, you know, interact in the house. So here we are. See, we have a new mansion exterior with the, with the dithering. Um, here we have Gemma Collins, a famous UK reality star, uh, MC Hammer, Mario Lopez, and Guy Fieri. I wonder what they will get up to. Um, Gemma is being extremely awkward, but Mario points at me and starts clapping. Uh, MC Hammer really would like uh, to avoid Mario and Gemma, and now Dave Coulier is here. Um, Kamala Harris arrives from the kitchen, and yeah, we've got a mix of all kinds of celebrities, politicians. Um, there's, oh, the sound of broken glass comes from the kitchen. Um, Brigitte Nielsen is here in the living room. Um, she... Uh, she was on The Surreal Life, which was one of the original Celebrity Mansion shows. I wonder if she's the murderer. Um, where did we hear the breaking glass? <gasps> oh, no, Guy. Who could have killed Guy Fieri? Yeah, so when you use the look, it will list, you know, any bodies or items that are, that are relevant. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow, Cisco, and Kim Kardashian are hanging out in the, in the bedroom. Kim is being extremely awkward, and she acts above it all. Um, I met her once at an Activision event, and she was actually one of the most beautiful and gracious people I had ever seen in my life. It was truly astonishing. Um, now, Gwyneth is trying to pick a fight with her. Gemma arrives from the bathroom. I wonder if no one's in the bathroom now. Um, probably have only a couple more minutes to do this. So let's just see. Um, Cisco wants a vegan menu. I'm going to accuse Kamala Harris. Oh, no. So Kamal is not the murderer. Um, we maybe need to just, like, wait for another person to die. Because um, then we we would know who it is. But, yeah, basically, this is sort of all you do right now. Um, watch the celebrities interact. <gasps> Sound like a scuffle in the swimming pool. Now we're going to solve it because Lindsay Lohan's the only one here. Uh, pool noodle with bloody fingerprints. So Lindsay Lohan has killed MC Hammer with a pool noodle yes all right sorry Lindsay. um so yeah we probably got a couple more minutes let me just generate one more instance and see who comes because every time i play it sometimes just really funny things happen certain celebrities following me following each other complaining about each other 
Um, and as we said, right now we kind of figured this would be kind of about watching them interact and evaluating their behavior and noting the movement of items and sort of making accusations. But now I think it would be more fun if you as the player could also interact with the items and, and potentially kill the celebrities yourself. Um, Gwyneth says, hell yeah, now we're talking. Uh, Kobe wants to know how Gwyneth got her bruise. Gwyneth says, who else, who here is single? She's here to party. <laughs> Kobe wants to know why don't any of the windows open. Now they're arguing, so maybe we'll leave them alone. Um, Rudy Giuliani says someone stole his medication. Uh, New York is not going to be hanging out with Rudy Giuliani. Uh, we find Gwyneth deep in conversation with Kobe and New York as Ellen arrives from the kitchen. Um, Jenny McCarthy is talking to Ezra Miller about energy fields. And it's funny to me because I can imagine this happening. Oh, Fox Mulder is here. Ezra Miller is clearly the third wheel. He's had a, he's had a, a rough couple of years, personally, I think. Um, Jenny says, we're not all getting out of here alive. That's true, Jenny. And Kobe is developing an inappropriate fixation on Ezra. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the experiment that we have so far we, we um i'm gonna i'll show more of it in a little bit um but before i go on i want to talk a little bit about why we are working in this genre and um why it is so exciting to me as a creator so why reality and why the y2k era mcmansions um i mean we all have our little things and one of mine as a narrative focused game designer is something that I call constructed reality. Um, and to me, constructed reality means contained simulationist spaces with systems of rules. Um, and sometimes these rules are explicitly games and game mechanics and sometimes not, but they're rules of some kind um, implemented to um, encourage social narrative to emerge. Um, and, and I think this idea of constructed reality is more relevant now than ever when, you know, thanks to pandemic and social media and algorithms, we're living increasingly as projections in a digital simulation. Um, we're isolated and abstracted from the one to one. Um, and as I've said, we're all kind of playing characters in this space online, um, whether everything is systems and game driven now or not, and whether we have agreed to participate or not. And I think that's a lot of why um, murder mysteries and thrillers are enjoying such a huge renaissance on, uh, right now on platform on on streaming platforms. Um, thrillers and mysteries are also rule driven, constructed realities um, about wh how well you can trust how someone presents themselves and who you think is responsible for a crime and why. And I think that kind of thing is just very valuable for us all to practice right now, um, studying credibility and studying intention in these exaggerated real worlds where we are all performing um, and in particular this is also for me reality shows as well as social media are about modeling conflict in simulated environments um, you know like we do on Twitter and like we do on reality shows um, I know we have also had Florence Smith Nichols lightning talk this weekend about how the British dating competition Love Island is a roguelike and and I completely completely agree um, I couldn't be more excited to see this talk uh, which at the time of recording I haven't seen yet otherwise I'm sure I would be citing from it quite a lot. Um, so we have these contestants that are trapped in like a paradise limbo circumstance. Um, they're not allowed to have devices. They're not allowed to have pen and paper um, or anything that might intervene on the core mechanic of talking to one another um, in an attempt to match with someone that they can, you know, go all the way to the end of the simulation with. And, and every, you know, week or whatever, they do challenges that are designed to be disruptive to the social bonds they already have. And, and the producers will, you know, they sometimes introduce Produce fluffy, you know, swimsuit whipped cream competitions when they want to turn up the heat. And then, you know, when couples are starting to get along, that's when they reveal, you know, fan tweets about their relationships and they make them guess, you know, what's being said. Or, you know, they reveal things from people's past to intentionally kind of mess with their perception and, and mess with the social dynamics. And, and this is a system that sometimes generates some truly hilarious results. Um, you know, caveat, of course, human beings are not simply content generation 
engines. Um, people often say that reality TV is exploitive and, you know, obviously there are ethical issues. Um, this is just really recently. I could probably find a hundred more headlines like this. Um, but, you know, I do want to point out that there is, you know, exploitation all over entertainment, for example, like the video game industry is an inhumane capitalist machine um, that often acts as a de facto advertiser of the military industrial complex. Um, so when people are like, oh, reality is trashy and it's so exploitive and how can you watch that? It's so stupid. You know, I'm like, you know, you're you're like role playing as an elf and having sex with bears um so i don't know like if it helps necessarily like again not denying that there can be problems when we're creating these kinds of simulations and putting people into high stress situation for the sake of games but you know we do that all over the industry and we ratify it um a lot more easily a lot of the time and i think unfortunately a lot of the prejudices against reality tv have to do with it being stuff that girls like um and and also i don't think we need to assume you know particularly in the era of reality shows that i'm that brian and i are citing in this project you know that you know we have to take the participants agency away to this extent and assume they're just so stupid that they don't know what they're doing and they don't know how they're you know being used um people always say it's you know problematic for people to be famous for being famous but i actually i think it takes a lot of a, a, a type of courage and generosity to reveal some of your worst aspects in public and to caricaturize yourself and, and basically be a character for other people in this way. Um, I think it gets a lot more interesting to me when you think of celebrity culture and reality show culture and, and micro celebrity culture as, as a form of game protagonism that occurs in a constructed reality. Um, so now I bet you, you kind of want to see some spreadsheets, um, cause there's some interesting stuff that Brian did that enables us to, you know, make this simulation. Um, so the game itself is a simple, um, JavaScript engine. It's partially used as a practical experiment in Svelte. Um, there's an API in our design sheet that enables real time querying. Um, and we use this both for the content as well as like styling and presentation things, uh, like the procedural input, like the boot screen, boot screen sequence that you may have seen. Um, so this is what Brian sent me on discord when I asked about it. Um, this is not the language that I speak. Um, but some of you will probably know what it means. <laughs> Um, so in addition, uh, all of the images of our rooms are generated somewhat randomly each instance via a procedurally built query, which um, we run against the Bing image search API, um, which is hosted on Azure. Um, the raw images are then post-processed on the client side in plain JavaScript using um, simple monochrome Floyd Steinberg dithering, which is how we get that harmonious vintage Macintosh effect that we both like so much. Um, one important thing to note is that at scale, API costs for this would become pretty high, and um, we're also just pulling images off a search engine with no consideration of provenance, um, which you know can cause problems, and, and those are things we would have to do differently if we wanted to do something like this at scale. Um, so now who wants to see a spreadsheet? Uh, let's do that. Um, so let me see for the spreadsheet itself. Um, I know all my narrative people in the audience will be happy to see this. Um, we're still experimenting a lot with this, so not every tab is going to be relevant, but, um, starting here, looking at the rooms tab and let's blow this up so you can see it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so rooms tab, yeah, we list every room in the house, um, and these are the search strings that we use to, um, you know, query. So all of our bathrooms are like expensive toilet, dark 1990s toilet mansion bathroom. Um, you notice I'm using the term cocaine decor here. Um, I think that's like a known architectural term, but it's also a curation by a particular person, cocaine decor on, twi on Twitter. Um, and uh, the cocaine decor public account does uh, tributes to all kinds of like lavish, excessive, glassy, chrome intensive architecture, which I thought was just really good for the um, McMansion vibe and for celebrity culture in general. Um, so basically the directional orientation, as you can see, of the rooms to each other doesn't currently change. Um, so we were able to set how each room is adjacent to each other. And then you can see what type of objects are, uh, may potentially be generated um, in that room and then how they change after the murder occurs. Um, so that is how we generate the mansion. Um, now let's look at what celebrities are in here. Um, <laughs> so my one weird trick, you may notice um, 
something familiar about these columns. One of my weird tricks for labor saving when you have to create a large volume of content is to create some kind of category for yourself, even though even if those are totally arbitrary. Um, and in this case, I used the Pokemon elemental table uh, to inform how each celebrity would act. Um, it really, really helped me to think about, you know, what is a steel behavior? What is a fire behavior? Um, Ozzy Osbourne is dark rock. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Nicole Pelizzi, that's our famous Snooki. She seems like a fighting fairy to me. Um, yeah, so, and then I just kind of arbitrarily assigned combinations of elements to each celebrity um, based on pretty much what type of Pokemon I thought they would be. Um, so we have like Brett Michaels is Poison and Rock, um, I, because, and we have Steve Harvey, who we, who we met in the house. He's Poison Grass, because I find that I only watch him when I'm stoned. And uh, I've given Leo DiCaprio ice and water because of my favorite film of his. And uh, Elon Musk is here. He's a normal bug. Um, some are random. It's uh, pretty much entirely arbitrary. But the point is that it helped me to create some kind of matrix um, to inform my ideas, which to me is, is just a lot, a lot easier than generating hundreds of unique lines. And we've got a lot in here, I think. Um, we've done a fair bit of work on this. And, and, it, and it made it easier to, yeah, there's probably, there's a bunch of celebrities here, maybe not as many as I thought, but it's easier than starting from a complete blank. The um, elements in, in importantly inform the behaviors as well. Like here's a normal behavior, here's a fire behavior, here's a water behavior, especially if you're like me and you're into tarot and woo woo stuff and you already associate elements with feelings or behaviors. Um, you know, again, giving myself this matrix to work with made it much easier to populate and, and update this spreadsheet in a, in a more detail intensive and a more robust way. And you can see actually in this spreadsheet we have done quite a lot quite a lot of behaviors and I don't think I could have just written all of this so quickly if you know we hadn't been using the elemental table to organize it um, which is cool um, so ambient behaviors are the meat on the bone and this is how the system ge generates behavior and interactions um, for each celebrity in the house um, and so they can also, you know, if there's multiple celebrities in the room, I can have them interact with each other using these nickname fields. Um, so there's a couple huge, huge takeaways here that I want to emphasize. I hand wrote every line of these and I hand tweak them and that's why they tend to work, you know, pretty well together every time that they are generated. Um, I point this out because people and probably no one here attending this particular conference is going to have this opinion but you know all over social media I see conversations where people tend to make like blanket statements that generative tech is bad for writers and yes AI and you know corporate AI is bad for the content economy unequivocally no one's saying otherwise but in a situation like this um, the all the components of what is generated are authored and for me the generative process is a way for me to have this recombinant, componentized relationship to my own work. Um, and of course, I think, you know, again, every I don't have to tell anybody here this, but working in a generative mode is not actually labor saving. Um, and in fact, in fact, it might be more difficult and complex to, you know, componentize the things that you need in a way that will function for you renewably um, than it would be to just write something linear. Um, this is generative because I want it to be generative. This, you know, this is made the way it is because we think it's fun. Um, and yeah, that's how it works. Um, and another important thing uh, that I want to emphasize, oh, I guess these are some other old behaviors that I was, you know, I, I divided them, you know, each, each element needs to have a quote, a question, a, a two-person interaction, a three-person interaction, positive and negative. And again, in addition to the elemental table, using this kind of arbitrary matrix to make sure that I, um, you know, it, it helped me fill in the content categories and make sure that content types were evenly distributed. Um, so if you're going to do something that has, you know, a lot of content components in a spreadsheet, you should come up with the organizational matrix beforehand, again, even if it's totally arbitrary, because um, that can help you ensure um, coverage from the beginning of all the topics or tags or keywords or whatever that, that you feel that, that you need to hit. Um, here's some old ones. Um, Celeb is sobbing loudly, blazing a J. Um, of course, that goes with the grass element. So yeah, um, flying, furiously meditates. You know, a, a lot of these Pokemon elements um, go naturally um, with, with um, 
celebrity behavior. And finally, here we have a tab uh, with the murder announcements. So if you're not in a room and you hear someone be killed, it will tell you uh, where that's happening so that you can investigate. Um, so another thing I really want to emphasize about this spreadsheet is that you'll notice that like every tab of this is in completely plain language. Anything I do in the tools is updated in the instance immediately. Um, it's a zero latency iterative process for me as a writer. And I would go so far to say that if you want to do anything good from a content standpoint with spreadsheets and generative tech, you absolutely need to prioritize minimizing this latency for the writer. Um, everything is legible, everything is plain language, and it is quickly testable um, on the spreadsheet. You can quickly, you know, push it to the build and test it, like, you know, without... Zero, literally zero latency. Um, there's just no reason we got to stay like pushing full builds, um, you know, in order to see if content is working. Uh, we need to have that zero latency process so you can like tweak something without having to learn any code and then watch it populate in, in the instance that you're working with. Um, I also worked that way on Reigns Her Majesty. Um, I was working in a plain language spreadsheet, not only writing the content in plain language, but assigning statistical values, statistical movement, um, how the content was connected to other pieces of content. Um, basically, you know, I was able to, to work pretty independently, even though I really don't have a technical background, um, and um, immediately test it in an instance so I could see. Um, because obviously, when you're making content, it's going to look you know, you, you simply can't tell how it's going to perform in the UI, how it's going to perform in context from looking at it on a spreadsheet. So being able to go back and forth from the content input system to, you know, the instance without latency is, is super, super important. I think that's why um, Reigns Her Majesty is the only game I've gotten writing awards for because I had a tool set that enabled me to kind of do my best work, basically. Um, and yeah, even though this is just kind of like an experiment that Brian and I kick around in our spare time, um, it, which doesn't tend to be copious. This is kind of, you know, the generative reality show murder game is like the slot machines, the slot machine wheels of my eyes have locked into like my favorite generative instance. This is a dream project for me. Um, and I have to, you know, take some time to really thank Brian for his gener generosity and support and mentorship of me um, with this project and around, you know, a lot of different things that, that he helps me with. Um, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this community who owes him some thanks. Um, a couple years ago, I reached out to him to ask if, you know, he'd be willing to teach me more about how all this stuff works, basically how I, as a narrative designer, could better understand spreadsheets as a back end for generative tools and um, how I could work in a way that was accessible to coders like him. And even though we have um, completely different backgrounds, and even though I don't think Brian's thing is normally celebrity culture, we just like vibe so much and we work super well together and we really understand each other on fundamental things. So um, to me, there's another lesson there, which is to reach out to people that you admire, especially if they have skills that you just totally don't and um, see what you can learn. Uh, you know, if you're a crunchy generative coder, maybe find a writer to work with who's obsessed with some kind of storytelling you know nothing about. Um, you never know what can happen. And again, make sure that the tools are kind of enabling that, that low latency process, I think. Like, that's kind of some of my best takeaways for, for, for you today from this. You never know what can happen. Um, I hope you will look at reality shows a little bit differently now um, as fun generative systems of human behavior. Um, and I hope you'll think about what kind of constructed realities most interest you in a generative context. Um, yeah, I would love to meet anybody who wants to talk about this more. Um, and thank you so much for your time and interest here today. Um, and especially thanks to the Roguelike Celebration team for all their hard work and the labor of love uh, that this event is. Um, thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. I am here in person, Leigh is in text chat, um, recovering from sickness, but has been enjoying uh, all of this. And I do want, I know we're a bit late, but we also started the net pack, like net pack went a bit late. So we're gonna ask one silly question that's been top voted and one uh, not entirely silly question. I will just read out Leigh's answers. The, uh, let's start with the not silly question of with this, Category method, do you use it to link bits of content together or inspire links? Uh, is there somewhere that people could go to understand that technique better? People found it really interesting. Uh, is the answer, ask Brian. Yeah, if you respond there, like, I'll, I'll read out your, your response. I'll be your voice. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, I can repeat. Yes, don't worry. So that kind of category method that you showed, do you use it to link bits of content together or inspire links? And is there somewhere people could maybe find more like places to understand that that content category linking system better? Um, and if you would like to, yeah, cool. Hi. So, so sorry, I couldn't give the talk live. I'm not feeling a hundred percent, but I'd love to answer some questions. Oh, so in, in my case, it was sort of arbitrary, but because I was working on a project that was about kind of broadly systematizing behavior for the purpose of orienting certain characters against others, I was like, oh, let's use the Pokemon table because it's a, a sophisticated system of types where there are affinities and oppositions. And, and that was something I thought was kind of going to be relevant for a game of about celebrity relationships. So, um, and then and then from there, it was really nice. Like, you know, um, you could make certain associations with grass. I can make certain associations with rock or darkness. And then that kind of made it easier. Like there, there was something there that was broad, but piqued my imagination that sort of helped me organize the content categories. So I guess like, you know, think of other games you play and, and how they organize information and find a way to translate your content body into that context, I guess would be my advice. Yeah. Yeah, it reminded me some of uh, Emily Short's Annals of the Pre-Eggs, like the Venom and, and associations like that. So excellent. Um, the one silly question we'll ask you before uh, letting you rest is, uh, Railsby asked, what Pokemon types are you? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> like, I want to say like Psychic Fairy, but uh, I'm I think I, I would probably be like a, a, a one of the um, I would probably just be a grass Pokemon, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like Bulbasaur. That that I, I relate to Bulbasaur, yeah. but I mean, I don't know. Um, some weird type that nobody likes to use and, and has a terrible character design. One of those. <laughs> strong against nothing. It's just like yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Grass fairy. Uh, <laughs> grass fairy. Okay. Yeah, that, I, I definitely grass fairy sounds about right for me. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, I know I'm sick on my birthday, but like it's been such an honor to spend it here. I've always wanted to be part of an event like this. I'm so grateful to everybody for having me, and and thanks to everybody who who works on this conference for for everything they've done to make it wonderful. Um, I hope the rest of the day goes well. Um, thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thanks. All right.